best pedagogy, whether at any level, is understanding each person's metaphor, but their embodied experience in that moment and working with them to transform it if they want. Welcome to this conversation with Professor Sohail Inayatola. He is the UNESCO Chair in Future Studies, a political scientist and futurist at Tam Kang University in Taipei. He's also an associate at Melbourne Business School at the University of Melbourne. Sohail has authored and co-edited 25 books. He's written more than 350 journal articles, book chapters, encyclopedia entries, and magazine editorials. Sohail has done transformative research and practice, most notably causal layered analysis, a futures methodology. I'm Deborah M. Wilson, a reading specialist and educational consultant and founder of School Moves. My work focuses on collaboration between general education and special education staff. I'm the author of two forthcoming books from Norton Publishing on the application of polyvagal theory in the classroom. Enjoy the conversation. In the space that you talk about, alternative futures, looking at what's possible, we have our used future. Do we want to, to keep with the used future or do we want that alternative future? We can't see alternative futures unless we're in ventral. In your language, it goes, so ventral is the kind of list out many choices phase, right? And the fight or flight is called what? Sympathetic. So sympathetic. And then the world is ending, let's hide in the ground is? The dorsal bagel. And I, you can remember, uh, right, just you're shutting the door. You're shutting the door to the world. Okay. I'm holding it all back. I'm hiding from it. For me, sympathetic is a place of opportunity because we have a lot of energy but it's chaotic and it's disorganized. If you have the resources, you're going to go up into ventral. You, CLA, is yeah. a resource that gets them up. If they don't have it, they and this doesn't work, the fight or flight, then they just shut down and say whatever. Tell me if this makes sense. The bliss now is really nothing matters. You're in a state of bliss. The but that's a blended, is- okay, so that's a blended state. So that is uh, a state of ventral and dorsal. So you have that ventral energy and you're able to be quietly still. It's called quietly still. When I'm giving speeches, I actually feel that. So I feel totally, I'm not doing it. I'm in a state of bliss. I'm with a community. We're all flowing together. You do. You are in a blended state where yeah, you okay. brought in that quieting energy of dorsal, but you don't shut down. No, it's really nice. Okay. And that's a very then, difficult state to get into, especially if you're in front of a whole group of people. You really understand your nervous system. Then there's the other one which you're saying, well, like a lot of futures work is we want to empower people. So I know the number of people in workshops begin to cry or say, oh my God, I never, you're the first one who asked me what my preferred future is. I never knew we were allowed to have a preferred future. And then some people get into shock. Oh my God, there's actually alternatives. So those two are huge jumps for many people. For others, it's just common base. We're always thinking of alternatives. But if you're in a constricted world where there's no choices, suddenly the notion that there's choices becomes quite empowering. It's a perfect segue to schools. And what I'm trying to do by bringing this futures literacy, you use that term in your in your the, yeah, yeah. the in your book about the, the cow, those different scenarios in the book. Yes. I read that. And I think that that is what is missing for our students. I think they don't always realize that they can have a preferred future. They can have an alternative future. So how do we, like everything's about growth mindset, growth mindset. Well, if somebody's in a fixed mindset, that's what I tried to do in the book was say, is there something between those that black and white duality of growth and fixed? And I think it's evolving. So you have an evolving mindset where you start to realize through CLA, through that activity, that that there are options and a preferred future that can get you into growth mindset. Oh, wait, you know, I think I can learn this. I can learn this if I have the right support, if I have the special ed teacher, if I have the occupational therapist, if I have my parents, who, whomever, like, what is it that I have in my orbit that I can, those resources that I can bring in at level two to support this yeah. new, right? This new preferred future that I'm, I'm shooting for. They feel empowered. Yes. So I when I tried to frame this as a theory of power, phase one is not fair. They have bread. I don't have bread. And then futures in that phase becomes, well, how do I create my own bread, find my own bread? 
And now we go to opportunities, emerging issues analysis. And to start to do that, then, then of course, then I need to know what are the futures of bread? How do I have futures of food? How do I empower myself? Then we move to vision. Here's what it looks like where I'm satisfied, happy. And then we finally go to this kind of the supportive story. What's the new story that gets me there? So for students, they're often in the kind of the lowest part in a way, right? I don't have my bread. I'm in a hierarchical system where I feel disempowered. The best student in the class, he's getting all the attention. She's getting attention, but I'm not. And so then that's where they go to fight or flight or they go into, let me shut the door. This is all too much for me. Let me just escape into in whatever the escape is. I call that quietly failing. Uh, so that's, that's many... Just, so that's a different. So yeah. one is shutting out. The second is quietly failing. Right. That you can do both. You can do dorsal. You can be in dorsal vagal where you just kind of curl up into a ball, or you can be in a classroom where you're sitting. You look like you're attentive. You look like you're. <laughs> yeah. You're not causing trouble. You're not throwing chairs across the room. You're just sitting there quietly failing. You know you can't do it, but you're going to sit upright. You're going to pretend you can. Yeah. But everything in you and your whole nervous system is saying you you really can't do this. So I'll just look like I'm here and look like I'm yeah. participating. And and those students are overlooked because they don't cause trouble. They appear to be focused and listening. Yes. But they are not gathering that that information and they're not using it and their story. You know, if we did a CLA with them yes. and you really open that up, you the story would be. I, this is too much for me. I can't do it. I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm ADHD. I'm whatever. And I just can't keep up with the pace of this classroom. So I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to really cause trouble, but I'm tuned out. I'm somewhere else. I've seen that in organizations. I remember one workshop I ran, it was through different organizations combined by the minister. And two of the groups were fantastic. And one group started out very passive. And then as we get into the futures part, they suddenly got more active. But their activity went to what you were saying about, very aggressive, angry. And I said, so what's your story here? They said, oh, we're sardines in a smoothie maker. We're a piece of dust. Every new minister dusts away and throws us away. Wow. So of course, so they that was their experience that uh, of not being valued. Their division kept on being sent to another organization. No one wanted them. And so then when I gave them Let's do futures. Everyone else said, okay, great. Here's a way to empower myself, brighter future. This is great stuff. They actually went to extreme anger. And so then it was very puzzling. And I was like, well, I don't want to be here. So I looked at the CEO and I just said, I'd rather go home. This is a really aggravated group. This is really not much fun for me. And then when we did the CLA with them, then it became very clear that they were in suffering. And they went from, I think, quietly failing, oh, is there a chance? Let me pick up my stick. That's why Deb Dana uses this ladder analogy. You have to climb the run right. and you have to go through sympathetic. And then from sympathetic, if you have the resources available, you were their resource. Yes. So they had a ventral resource available for them. You were in ventral, yes. you stayed in ventral, you managed your nervous system. You said, what's going on here? Let's let's go and check into this. So they went into that. And then from there, they climb a few more runs up the ladder and they can get to ventral with that supporting resource. And that's what we're trying to do in schools is say, what are those resources, those interactive resources between inside ourselves, outside yes. in the environment and between others in relationship. What you do is if you create a relationship with them, you become a person who sees them, who okay. wants to understand more and now yeah. you're in relationship. So it's supporting, you have that resource that's supporting them so they can move back up in their nervous system, back into ventral, where now they can see options and that's where they can see their preferred features. Okay. This actually makes a difference because it embodies CLA. I talk about embodied movement. I talk about embodied learning. I talk about that all the time. And then when you said, without knowing anything about me, really, and, and the terms I use, and when you use the term embodied CLA, that is... I, it was just brilliant to me when you when you use that term, and I thought, well, what does that mean exactly? What does that mean well, to you? Well, for me, so the metaphor. Okay, there's two levels. One is people can use metaphor in uh, 
exclusive ways, right? To shut people out. So this is where, but so that's one issue, how to create more inclusive storytelling. Now the second part is if there's a conflict between stories, what we found, you can tell a better story, but, but then people are still getting lost at the story level. So then we have systemic changes, legislative changes, legal changes, taxation changes, rules in the UN system, right? The global regulatory system, and what I learned from you is either fight or flight right now, or freeze or let me shut down. COVID has made that even worse. We're right. shutting down fight or flight, and there's this disruption in the global regulatory system uh, from the global body. So what I got from you is, okay, so do the CLA, but if you're in a room full of people, the resistance is at the, is at the nervous system level. So then it's a different strategy. If it's a nervous system level, then it could reduce it. What's the resource? Is it breathing? Is it a heart? Is it moving, you know, all your stages there? So that what I thought was very powerful. So it explains why sometimes the better metaphor in CLA may not work because their regulatory system hasn't accepted it. Yes. So this is what I got from it. So one at the local level in, in, in a person, then what I got from you is this is a sharing of nervous systems. So it's collective. And then if we push for, forward, if we see Gaia, what Lovelock says is a global regulatory nervous system, then we see it's in crisis as well. Yeah. So this is where your language pushes it because it's embodied in the personal body, our shared body, and in the global body. So th this is kind of what I think that you're adding to it. So I have a colleague, and CLA worked well with her because in the business world, there's endless emails back and forth. And she's a reflective, thoughtful person. And she was trying to, what do I do with this project? It's endless emails, nonstop requests. And I said, well, what does it feel like at the metaphor level? She said, aha, they're on a jet plane flying very quickly. I'm on a train. The train is reflective, thoughtful, step by step. It makes my nervous system calm. But then she said she didn't want to be disturbed by their jet plane world. So then once she had a story, she's the train. That's okay. They can be Japanese, but she's the train. And I said, well, what's the systemic strategy that keeps you in train world? She says, well, I'm not going to respond to their emails every day. They can send them. A train has to be the train, and she's comfortable being the train. Now, it was an, if it was another colleague, that person may say, well, actually, I want to enter the jet world. But that's a different process. This person was quite clear once that person understood jet world versus train world, which world she felt more comfortable in. So part of CLA is figuring out what metaphor works best for you. There's no evaluation in that sense. It's a personal storytelling. We learn by stories. Our whole, we learn everything by metaphor. I mean, and there's a 600 page book around the divided brain that McGillcrest wrote. And the very end, he talks about metaphor and how important it is in our world. After 600 pages, he ends with, it's all about <laughs> metaphor. So I think adding your work at the personal level is very profound. Now you're also going to the next level. So, okay, well, that's true, but let's see the vagus nerve system as a collective nervous system. So if someone in a war situation, they're all in trauma, right? If they're in trauma, how storytelling will help. That does help. But the trauma remembers, you know, the violence, the war, all that stuff, rape, et cetera. How do we undo that at the collective level? So I think that's why it's quite interesting to me it, are there collective meridian points? What's the what's the vagus nerve system at a collective level? So I think those are some things that'd be really interesting to pursue. I don't quite know how to do that, but I can see in my own life, I mean, because I've tr been traveling so much, you know, you're wired and tired after. So I know what, what I do when I'm wired and tired, like yesterday, I get my keynote on the future of sports for New Zealand. So I made sure to walk an extra hour, make sure not to go to the dinner program, make sure to get a massage. So it's all things, how do I calm the nervous system down? So I think that's the link. So storytelling metaphors are critical part. I think you're adding the next ingredient to the soup. And then that's my take. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Deborah. Yeah, that does. And when I was doing this work, 
and doing all the research for the books, I found this gap in the mind and the storytelling and where does that fit in? Because the polyvagal researchers and practitioners really understand the nervous system. And I thought, well, but there's, Dr. Porges will tell us there's a bi-directional link between our mind and our body. This is constantly going on, right? The best pedagogy, whether at any level, is understanding each person's metaphor, but their embodied experience in that moment and working with them to transform it if they want. And a new metaphor helps us, figures out where we need to do, what to do, and there's a moment of relief. Aha, here's what I was doing before. Here's a better story. You bring in actually the metaphor has to be embodied. So I could have a new story of myself, but if the body doesn't believe the story, then we go back to the old trauma. So this is where inner body work, whether it's tapping, whether it's massage, or figuring out how do I get the parasympathetic nervous system to understand my new story. I think that's our, our challenge in our classroom and in what you're doing as well is we, we have to be able to observe those nervous system states and observe yeah. when they start shifting and have those resources available to bring them back into ventral. Those, you know. so with your students, do you call them on it? Because for me, because they're adults, if I see someone sitting like this or cross-legged, then I say, it appears you're in a resistance mode. Can you please tell me what's going on? And once I state that, they straight away feel better because what I learned from you is they feel hurt and thus they can start to calm down. So with your students, is that what you do? I mean, what do you do when you, but you would say, because your students, younger people, you make them do kinetic learning, right? To express that disconnect. I give them resources. And I think- Ah, that's the- Yeah, okay. the resources are available. So the very first thing is this, just kind of listen and link. So you're going to listen to where- they are in their nervous system and then link it to the state. Because once we understand they're in shutdown or they're in fight or flight, from there it's, you know, I would be working with the whole class of where what are our resources. So we'd have global resources in the classroom, but we'd also have individual resources. As much as possible, I want them to be, and Deb Dana uses the term that I love, active operators of their nervous systems. Think about if we had a world where all these students left the schooling environment, went into the world already understanding and had this knowledge about their nervous systems. Think about where we could be. In book two, I have, it's called the polyvagal backpack. So in book one, we're on the ventral path. That's beautiful. Right? Okay. Yeah, so, so in book one, we're kind of looking at like, we're on this path and where are we heading and who's on the path with us and what do we need? Toward the end of book one, I start talking about this backpack we have. And the backpack's going to change depending on where you are, what you're doing, what your objectives are. I have different supplies in my backpack depending on where That's I'm fantastic. going. That's fantastic. So, this is, so what do you do then in class to keep your nervous system in uh, ventral, right? That's principle one, right? Befriend your nervous system. I tell this story in book one. It's a true story of a, having a really bad day out on the tarmac in the snow and it was miserable and I was up all night with kids and they were sick and I was tired and I walk in and every kid who walked into my classroom, I was like, Arr. I was just at them. They couldn't do anything right. I was in such a foul mood. And a little voice from the back of the room said, Miss Wilson, I think you need to do your dots and squeezes, which is like this little <laughs> deep pressure activity. That's how you empower them is that they really understand where they are in their bodies at different times. I feel like in schools, we have mostly students in sympathetic. They're mostly in fight or flight. They're yes. it, and I think, and I call it, you know, a state of mobilized energy. It's chaotic. It's mobilized. So what we have to do is organize that energy. We have to get the mobilization going in the direction we want it to go, right? Instead of all random, and they're all over the place, and they're all over the map, you're, you, and, and that's where I do, you know, the quadrant word taps, where they're tapping. It's like a similar to a tapping thing, but I do it with words, where they get into this, this, okay rhythmic pattern where they're tapping words or they're they're moving and they're saying like I have them doing arrows like there's arrows on a screen with words so I have them moving very rhythmically because okay. it organizes all that chaos for them and they then move around the room or they, they move to different scenarios or they I don't quite understand well, first it. I have them move their body before okay. I before I would try to do a CLA activity with them I would I would 
organize the mobilization. And I do it through some rhythmic kind of occupational therapy type, deep pressure, heavy work. First, you have to take care of all this energy. First, you have to organize it. Yeah. Then you direct it. Now, okay. Now, now you're in so your there's, if they're If they're shut down, you want them to move towards sympathetic. Yes. And then you want to move them towards uh, the blissful pond. What did you call it? The ventral? Ventral. And it's not always, you know, blissful. I mean, ventral can still be very aware that I've got all this stuff coming at me. But you're okay with it. But I'm able to find my resources. I am able to find my resources inside myself, outside, by walking, like in the environment, walking in a peaceful place, walking in nature, going for a swim. And for me, it's swimming in my saltwater pool. I'm yes. able to find that yeah. outside and then between others and relationships. So I'm able to sit down with somebody I trust, I value, who can co-regulate. Yeah. And I yeah. think about polyvagal theory that I love that Deb Dana brings in is this loaning each other's nervous system. So what you're really doing in a room full of people is if you can maintain your ventral state, your and others are not, you're able to say, you can borrow my nervous system. I can loan this to you. I can help you to get to that place where you need to get because my nervous system and your nervous system are talking to each other. So you know Eckhart Tolle, he has his idea of the pain body. So if I'm in pain, I really don't want a solution. I want to suck everyone into my pain body. So I want to suck everyone into my disconnected nervous system. So everyone feels bad. Absolutely. But our goal, you're suggesting is the opposite. If I go to this, my nervous system is calm, regulated. They enter that space. So it's not the pain body, it's the it's the blissful body. Yes. So you're sharing the positive parts of the nervous system. I've run quite a few CLA workshops with the uh, I mean, with ministries, and they start out from their metaphors, the factory, the castle. In yeah. Norway, their better one was the jazz orchestra. Then uh, riffing off each other. One country, they said, no, it's too late for the orchestra. They said, it's the school system is the wrecking ball. We just have to destroy it. <laughs> and I love this. The factory transforms into the playground where learning yeah. becomes fun. I've been saying that all along, that the nervous system, if it doesn't feel like play, so play is a blending of ventral and sympathetic. So it's mobilized energy, it's active, but it's directed, and you're always holding hands with ventral. So that is what learning should be. It should be play. What about the principle here? Because when I run this with teachers, they all want play, students want play. The principle says no, keep off the grass. And the principals tell me they're control freaks. Their nervous system feels better when everything is controlled. My view before was, okay, the principles, I have to have the principal move. Play is too far for them. It is too far. Yeah. What I'm learning from you right now, it's not too far because they're command, control, factory work, factory leaders. Right. It's too far because their nervous system feels uncomfortable in play. You think of open or closed loops, right? Yes. Yeah. So the left hemisphere and the principal, the superintendent, school board, they're closed loop. Yes. They, they want to know where the numbers are, where we're going. They, they want to know the whole path, where we're we heading. And play is an open loop system. And it doesn't feel safe. Doesn't feel safe. Doesn't feel safe. So what I, what I do in school most of my workshops is I always provide all the theory and I don't call it play. And that this is where it's organized mobilization so that we're helping. We learn through movement. I mean, that's, that's how we, from birth, we learn through movement. It feels very safe to the principal because I've given the evidence-based that underpins that's, it. No, I understand. That's yeah, I, then they're okay. Yeah. Then they're okay with it. But just to say, we just need to play. Well, that's not safe. I think it, most teachers wouldn't feel that way either because all they see is chaos. There's times out at recess for free play where there's no objective, there's no direction, we're exploring. And then in the classroom, it becomes organized play where you've given them an objective, uh, even if they're trying to figure out a science experiment, they have their, it's play, but it's organized. And there's an objective at the end of the play. What have we discovered, right? No, that's so good. When we're working with people and we're 
inviting them to think a little bit differently. Like when I'm holding workshops and I'm doing some CLA with them, if they're all in this kind of chaotic energy in the room, what I find by doing CLA activity with them is that chaotic energy after they get it out, they get out their thoughts and their stories and their metaphors and their narratives. And, and then I see, then they start seeing each others and there's just something in the room that shifts like, oh, I've been seen, I've been heard, I'm valuable. Somebody's asked me my opinion. Somebody's asked me what I think about this. And then from there, we can work on, well, what is the alternative future? And what what is the future you're wanting to see? It's all about safety and connection. Yes. That's what the nervous system is longing for. That's what it's looking for. This is brilliant. It's so good to meet you. Warm hug. Yes, same here. The next part. Same here. Well, have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you.